When lupus or Sjogren's start attacking the brain and nerves, most people get the same message from the system. It is complicated. If my work has ever helped you, consider buying me a coffee by joining the membership. Every new member helps one more person. If you are interested type interested in the comments. And I will give you a heart. Dr. Shrug. Neurology says one thing. Rheumatology says another. Tests come back normal while your body is clearly not normal. What I want to do in this video is the opposite of that confusion. I want to walk you through a simple way of thinking about neurological problems in lupus and Sjogren's. Not a random list of symptoms, but a clear approach you can recognize, so that when something strange starts happening in your body, you understand what doctors should be looking for and why. Here is the big idea. There is a kind of dialect between lupus and Sjogren's. They are different diseases, but when they attack the nervous system, they often speak a similar language. Tingling, buzzing, burning, brain fog, balance problems, mood changes, even dementia-like symptoms. The goal is not to memeize every single possible syndrome. The goal is to understand the pattern and the mechanism. Because once you understand the mechanism, you can build a rational plan. That is the key. Not just, my MI was normal so I guess I am fine. A real plan that answers questions like, is this neurological problem coming from lupus or Sjogren's at all, or is it something non-autoimmune like diabetes, medication side effects, or small strokes? Is this something that needs strong immunosuppressive treatment that calms the immune system, or is it mainly a symptomatic nerve problem that you manage with pain control and lifestyle changes? If a dementia-like picture shows up, is it more like multiple sclerosis, or is it a rheumatic disease manifestation that behaves differently and needs a different strategy? By the time we are done, you will see that a lot of what looks vague and mysterious is actually very methodical when you know how to look at it. To make this real, I want to start with a case. A 55-year-old woman with well-established Sjogren's walks into the clinic. She already carries a diagnosis of autonomic neuropathy. That means the nerves that control automatic body functions like blood pressure, heart rate, sweating and digestion are misfiring. But today, that is not what scares her. It is the sensations. Listen to how she describes them. She tells her doctor, it feels like a buzzing over my left breast. She says, it is like someone is sticking an ice pick between my ears. Then she pauses and adds, sometimes it feels like caterpillars with sharp claws are crawling over my thighs. And finally, it is like popsicles are being dragged over my calves. If you take care of Sjogren's or live with it, this kind of language is strangely familiar. It sounds poetic at 8 a.m. when the clinic is quiet. By 5 p.m., when you are exhausted, it can feel like a headache for the doctor listening. But here is the critical point. If a doctor treats it as dramatic complaining and stops there, they miss the diagnosis completely. So what happens next? She is sent for an EMG and nerve conduction study. Those are tests that mainly look at the big, heavily myelinated nerves. The thick cables of the nervous system. The result comes back no objective evidence of a large fiber neuropathy. Essentially, normal. So she is referred for further evaluation. This is where the approach we talked about really matters. On examination, her strength is normal. Her power is normal. When the doctor checks vibration with a tuning fork and tests joint position sense, the big fiber pathways look fine. If you stop here, you will say, everything looks okay. That is what happens to many patients. But this is a Sjogren's patient with wild, specific sensory complaints. So instead of stopping, the careful clinician does one more thing. They take out a pin. They go back to the exact places she described. Over the caterpillars on the thighs. Over the popsicles on the calves. Over the buzzing area on the chest. And they test the smaller fiber nerves. This is where the story turns. In the next part, I will show you what that small fiber examination reveals what it means in the context of Sjogren's and lupus, and why so many patients are told your tests are normal when the real problem is hiding in a different layer of the nervous system. Before we continue, tell me in the comments where you are watching from and whether you live with lupus, Sjogren's, or both. It helps me understand who I am really talking to when we break this down in the next section. When the doctor finally checks the small fiber nerves, not the big ones, not the EMG ones, but the tiny pain temperature autonomic fibers, the truth shows up fast. These are the nerves that carry burning, stabbing, electric, icy, crawling sensations. 
These are also the nerves most commonly attacked in Sjogren's and often in Lupus. They are the nerves that never show up on standard EMG tests. This is why so many patients get dismissed. So when the clinician takes the pin and traces the area she described, something finally matches the story. She has patchy, inconsistent, hypersensitive zones. The pin feels sharp in one area, blunt in another, icy in the next. Classic small fiber neuropathy. Here's the problem. Most clinics don't test for this because it takes more time. It requires patience. And because the big fiber tests come back normal, a lot of doctors stop looking. But small fiber nerve damage isn't subtle. It's just invisible if you use the wrong tools. Now, here's where the dialect between lupus and Sjogren's becomes important. What this pattern really means. When you see sensations like buzzing, ice pick pain, crawling feelings, cold patches, stabbing heat, electric shocks, and the big nerve tests are normal, but the pin exam is abnormal, this almost always tells you one thing. You're in the territory of immune-driven small fiber neuropathy. And in Sjogren's especially, small fiber neuropathy can show up years before the big autoimmune markers rise or before the diagnosis becomes obvious. This is why early neurological symptoms are often the first whisper of the disease. How doctors should think, but often don't. When a patient has this pattern, dramatic sensory descriptions but normal EMG, a good clinician asks two quick questions. Is this immune-mediated? Meaning, is Sjogren's or Lupus attacking the small nerves directly? Is this autonomic too? Because when the tiny sensory fibers are involved, the tiny autonomic fibers often are too. That means dizziness, heart racing, blood pressure swings, GI slowdown, bladder issues, temperature intolerance. This woman already had known autonomic neuropathy, so the story fits perfectly. Why it matters for treatment. A big mistake happens here across neurology clinics. Doctors confuse two completely different things. Immune damage to the nerves needs immunosuppressive treatment. Nerves that are misfiring after being damaged need symptomatic treatment. If you mix these up, you either overtreat or undertreat the patient. And both cause suffering. This is why the framework you're learning matters. In lupus and Sjogren's, both types of nerve problems can happen at the same time, and only a structured exam separates them. What happens next in this case? Once the small fiber involvement is confirmed, you now have to decide what is driving the attack. Is this a primary Sjogren's neuropathy? A mixed connective tissue pattern? A vasculitic neuropathy? A sensory ganglionopathy? Or an autonomic predominant neuropathy? Each one requires a different plan. And each one has a different prognosis. In the next part, I'll walk you through the exact steps to tell them apart, the same steps top neurologists and rheumatologists use, but almost no primary care doctor knows. Before we go on, type Neuromap in the comments if you want me to keep explaining the neurological side of Sjogren's and Lupus like this in future videos. Now that we've confirmed small fiber involvement in this patient, the next step is to figure out exactly what kind of immune attack is happening, because Sjogren's and Lupus don't damage nerves in one simple way. Instead, they create recognizable patterns, and once you learn to see those patterns, the entire diagnostic picture becomes much clearer. The first question any good clinician should ask is whether this is a classic small fiber neuropathy, where burning, buzzing, icy or electric sensations appear in scattered patches while strength, reflexes, and EMG tests remain normal, or whether this is actually a sensory ganglionopathy, which is far more serious because it attacks the root of the sensory system and leads to severe imbalance, loss of position sense, vanishing reflexes, and sensory loss that doesn't follow normal nerve pathways. If a doctor confuses ganglionopathy for small fiber neuropathy, they miss the one window where early treatment can prevent long-term disability, and unfortunately this mistake is incredibly common. After that, the next question is whether this could be a vasculitic neuropathy, which is what happens when the immune system attacks the blood vessels feeding the nerves. This usually shows up suddenly, often on one side, with sharp stepwise worsening, severe pain and sudden weakness like foot drop or wrist drop. And when it appears it almost always requires urgent immunosuppressive therapy because this is one of the true neurological emergencies in Sjogren's and Lupus. Once that possibility is addressed, the clinician has to step back and ask how deeply the autonomic nervous system is involved, because when small fiber sensory nerves are damaged, the tiny autonomic fibers usually get dragged into the fire as well, leading to heart racing when standing, 
blood pressure drops, unpredictable sweating, digestive slowdowns, bladder problems, temperature swings and the classic wired and exhausted, feeling that so many people with Sjogren's know too well. Since our patient already has autonomic neuropathy, this makes the entire picture even more specific and reinforces that we are not dealing with something random or psychological, but with a real immune-driven nerve disorder. At this point, you also have to look at the dialect of the disease, because lupus and Sjogren's both cause neuropathy, but their fingerprints are different. Sjogren's tends to produce small fiber neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, sensory ganglionopathy, trigeminal neuropathy, and those poetic, patchy sensory descriptions that sound bizarre but match the underlying mechanism perfectly. Lupus, on the other hand, leans more toward vasculitic neuropathy, mixed motor sensory problems and nerve issues that flare alongside systemic inflammation or central nervous system involvement like headaches, seizures, or cognitive trouble. Knowing which disease is speaking helps you guess the prognosis, the likely treatment response and the pace of the illness long before the lab results catch up. All of this matters because many autoimmune patients walk into clinics with neurological symptoms and walk out with dismissive explanations like your EMG is normal, or maybe it's stress, or let's wait and see, without anyone taking the time to understand what the nerves are actually doing. But when you use a structured neurological approach, the one we are building right now, the mystery disappears and the mechanism becomes visible. And once you understand the mechanism, deciding on treatment stops being guesswork and becomes a rational plan. In the next part, I'll break down exactly how doctors decide whether you need immunosuppressive therapy or whether your symptoms are coming from nerve misfiring that requires a completely different strategy. Before we move on, type I'm still watching in the comments so I know you're following the story. This is the turning point in the entire diagnostic process, because this is where a doctor must decide whether the immune system is still attacking the nerves right now or whether the damage already happened and the nerves are simply misfiring long after the fact. These two situations can produce identical symptoms for the patient, but the treatment could not be more different, and this is the reason so many people with lupus and Sjogren spend years going in circles without improvement. When the immune system is actively attacking the nerves, as you see in vasculitic neuropathy, in rapidly progressive small fiber neuropathy, or in sensory ganglionopathy, you are dealing with a dangerous, ongoing process. These patients tend to worsen quickly, the symptoms spread from one area to another, and the pattern does not stay still. In these cases, immunosuppressive treatment becomes essential because the inflammation must be stopped before it leads to long-term loss of function. This is when doctors consider treatments like high-dose for steroids, rituximab, or mycophenolate, not to reduce pain but to stop the underlying destruction. But if the immune attack happened years ago and the nerves are now stuck in a hypersensitive, unstable state, the situation changes completely. Here, the nerves are not being damaged, they are simply misfiring, just like a microphone that keeps producing feedback long after the electrical problem was fixed. In this scenario, the goal is not to suppress the immune system but to calm the nerve pathways with the right symptomatic treatment and lifestyle adjustments. Most patients in this group have stable symptoms that don't spread, and their blood work doesn't show signs of a current autoimmune flare. This is the group that often gets overtreated with unnecessary immunosuppression even though it won't change the core issue. The real challenge is that symptom intensity is not what determines treatment. A patient with widespread burning pain from old small fiber damage may feel much worse than someone with a mild but rapidly spreading weakness from new vasculitic damage, yet the second patient needs urgent immunosuppression while the first does not. This is why the framework matters so deeply. When you understand whether the immune system is active or whether the nerves are simply misfiring, you stop guessing and you start making decisions that actually change lives. Now, let's go into one of the hardest clinical puzzles in autoimmune neurology, because this is where even specialists hesitate. The question of whether a dementia-like picture is multiple sclerosis, lupus, Sjogren's, or a rheumatic process that looks exactly like MS but behaves completely differently beneath the surface. One of the most frightening neurologic complications in autoimmune disease is when a patient starts developing cognitive decline, memory trouble, slowed thinking, personality changes, or difficulty processing information. The immediate reflex in neurology is to ask whether this could be multiple sclerosis, because MS is the classic autoimmune disease that attacks the white matter of the brain and causes progressive neurological disability. But here is the uncomfortable truth. Sjogren's and lupus can mimic MS so closely that patients are misdiagnosed for years. 
The difference is that MS tends to leave a very specific fingerprint on MI scans and spinal fluid, while Sjogren's and lupus often create patchy, inconsistent abnormalities that don't match the classic MS pattern. In Sjogren's, for example, brain fog, slowed thinking, short-term memory trouble and concentration issues often come from microvascular inflammation, small fiber autonomic dysfunction, or immune-mediated metabolic changes within the brain. Not the demyelinating plaques you see in Ms. Lupos can cause a similar picture, especially when the disease affects the central nervous system. But even then the mechanism might be vascular inflammation or antibody-mediated disruption at the neuronal level, rather than MS-style demyelination. What makes the overlap difficult is that patients can look identical in the early stages. A person who is slow, forgetful, and mentally exhausted might be treated as if they have MS when the underlying problem is a rheumatic process that demands a different treatment plan. MS patients typically respond to MS-specific medications, while autoimmune rheumatic brain involvement may respond better to immunosuppression, anticoagulation if antiphospholipid antibodies are present, or aggressive control of the underlying systemic inflammation. This is why a structured neurological examination becomes so important. You're not just checking reflexes or strength. You're using the neurological exam as a lens, a platform, to understand the mechanism behind the symptoms. When you expose the mechanism, the diagnosis becomes obvious. In MS, the pattern is demyelination. In lupus, the pattern may be vascular inflammation or antibody-mediated interference. In Sjogren's, the pattern often involves small fiber dysfunction, autonomic instability, and microcognitive impairment. They look similar from the outside but behave differently inside the nervous system. A clinician who sees the mechanism instead of the surface will never confuse them. By the end of this talk, the goal is simple. For you to feel confident that neurological complications in lupus and Sjogren's are not mysterious, chaotic, or impossible to understand. They follow patterns. Those patterns follow mechanisms. And mechanisms lead to clear decisions. When you learn to distinguish small fiber neuropathy from sensory ganglionopathy, and sensory ganglionopathy from vasculitic neuropathy, and vasculitic neuropathy from autonomic dysfunction, you stop chasing symptoms and start understanding the story your nervous system is trying to tell you. When you step back and ask whether the symptoms reflect ongoing immune damage or the aftermath of old injury, you stop guessing blindly about treatment and start choosing what truly fits. And when you learn to look past labels like MS, brain fog, cognitive decline, or neuropathy and instead ask what mechanism is actually driving the problem, you get answers that many patients never receive. This is how you build a standardized, flexible diagnostic approach that works no matter how unusual or confusing the symptoms appear. You make the nervous system readable. You make the disease predictable. And you make the treatment rational. Before you go, tell me in the comments where you're watching from and the one neurological symptom you wish more doctors took seriously. It helps me tailor these breakdowns exactly to the people who need them most.